but anyway, let's get back to Torah study. Uh, that's why we're here. And uh, we, uh, to refresh memories, uh, the, uh, the, it, the Pharaoh has set the Israelites uh, free, saying, leave the land. You know, you, you've, you've done so many things. Uh, your, your God has done so many things. Uh, to our, our uh, uh, the Egyptian land that uh, go, go. And then, uh, but God says, I have to do one more thing. And uh, he turns the, instead of just having a direct route out of the land of Egypt, we, uh, we had discussed the, uh, th that, uh, God has them turn about, and uh, they seem to be astray, which tells, uh, which suggests to Pharaoh that <coughs> they don't know what they're doing, and that they're, and that the uh, the uh, God of the Israelites do not does not know what he's doing, and but God is, has said. Uh, the that he's going to stiffen Pharaoh's heart and make him think twice about letting the, the uh, people go, and that he's going to uh, do things to uh, uh, that Pharaoh uh, uh, will uh, uh, will again pursue the Israelites. And that's where we left off. So right now we are starting on uh, Exodus 13. Uh, excuse me, I think that's 14. <clears throat> yes, ex Exodus 14, Exodus 14, verse 5. Oh, okay. Yes, Don. Could, could I jump back for a second to Exodus 13, uh, verse 9, 18? It takes me a week to process these Saturday sessions, but I'm glad Rabbi Mary is here to help me with the Hebrew translation. So, Ask again, please. I was looking for our spot. Sorry. Okay, what did yeah. you say, Don? I'm sorry. He's going to ask you a question. A question, Rabbi Mary, yes. about chapter 13, verse 18. Um, and God led the people, God led the people about through the way of the wilderness of the Red Sea. And the children of Israel went up harnessed out of the land of Egypt. So I got interested in the word harnessed. And it, it looks to me like it's the word chamushim, um, which the best I could translate was armed. But that doesn't seem to fit the context. So I wondered what that what it is let me just translate the whole thing and ask you exactly what the question uh for what word you're talking about okay uh, and i'm translating i'm not reading the translation okay uh, bah, bah, bah. okay and god make them go around make around the people from the way of the desert Yam Suf, which is the what's called today the uh, Red Sea, or some people call the Red the Sea of Reeds, and Hamushim, and having arms, they went up. The uh, Ne Israel, the children of Israel, went up from the land of Egypt. So, okay, so what if, is yeah. the? Yeah. Sorry. The translation that I was reading was that the children of Israel went up harnessed out of the land of Egypt. But the word kamushim, which I which I'm hearing now from you, is means armed, which is Yes. So Yes. So that so can you enlarge on that a little bit? What how does how do they get armed? 
Well, uh, that's one of the things, I think we talk about it a little bit, but it seems like they took arms, just like they took the jewelry and so forth, maybe they took arms as well. Uh, although someone may claim that the, the jewelry was given to them, you know, it's like giving when you put the, the gun on the head of someone, just give me. Uh, or, and, and that's what it seems to be. Uh, Gail, are you following this? Uh, I have it here, but I didn't look where it is, Friedman, what Friedman yeah. said about the word. Yeah, I, like, I like Friedman's explanation. He said armed uh, or prepared to fight or resolute to fight. So you could be armed, you know, and psychologically, not just physically. Right. There's and that a kind lot of, of makes sense. Uh, I mean, it's like, yeah. yeah, it's kind of like there is a lot of midrash. Uh, it, all that takes us in multiple directions. There's even midrash <laughs> that by being armed, they were carrying the bones of Joseph. They were they were arming themselves with the the tradition set forth by, by in Genesis, in the book of Genesis, okay, that God was with them and everything. So take your pick. There's also a commentary in Plout. Yes. Rob was... gives the alternate explanation. Do you want to read that? Please, or... please do. Since I, I would, that I was, since somebody wanted to do it at this point, that's fine. Please do. Okay, Please so do. this is Rashi. Hamushim uh, means that one fifth from ham, ham, Hamash or um, Hamesh is five. So one fifth went out, four fifths having died during the plague of darkness. Mm -hmm. The theme that only a portion of the people left Egypt is found repeatedly in the Midrash, where traditions are recorded which said that only 150th or 1,500th went out. It's also possible that if Hamushim is related to Hamesh 5 or Hamishim 50, it may indicate troops of five or troops of 50 respectively. That is to say, Israel went out of Egypt like an organized army. And we had this before when they were camping yes. In organize in an organized fashion. Yeah, yes. it could, it could be, but you know. Wait a minute, one at a time. Uh, Rabbi Mary Tom, first. Uh, you know, when and I think that in English we say that too. Let's say that you go into a debate with someone. Let's say, let's say Hillary Clinton, and you say, um, "I'm armed with this." Um, with this reasoning, I'm armed with these facts, which becomes into um, I'm with something that can defend me, that can uh, you know that I, I I'm not going to be just attacked without having things to respond to. Uh, regarding the Hamushim and the Hamesh, it's um, it's a play on the word. And since there are not vowels in the Torah, it's difficult to say. But you cannot say Hamishim without a Yud. Uh, that's for uh, Lin. Um, it, it, that Hamashim, but not Hamishim. But, um, you know, a Rashi can twist and turn and explain all kinds of things in different ways. And they're always fascinating. Um, you know, uh, Difficult to say, Don. Um, you choose. I mean, you have here some suggestions. Choose which one you like. Okay. Um, thank, thank you, Rabbi Mary. I, I found the same midrash by Rashi um, who <coughs> intended that the word kamushim relates to the Hebrew word for five. So it should be understood mm -hmm. that only one fifth chose to leave and four, four fifths stayed. And um, and then they died during the three days of gloom. But then Ibn Ezra, Rashi's contemporary, was outraged by this, and he called the Rashi's commentary a sick evil. Um, that that um, they all wanted to leave. Um, so there is, there is some disagreement there. I, but I found that. I just kind of circled in on that one word and then kind of that expanded out 
more I read. So anyway, thank you very much. Uh, Marty, let me read another. Um, I've got, although a nation under the direct protection of God should not need arms to defend itself, it is the Torah's way that people should conduct themselves in a natural manner, and then, if necessary, God will intervene with miracles. That's Bakya. Yeah. Uh, Ricky, uh, Ricky, your your voice, your sound is really. Uh, you have to speak directly to into the speak the uh, microphone. Everybody. Yeah. But that's, uh, yeah, Don, that's what I was saying, that Hillary is going to say, you know, God is on my side. I'm yeah. coming armed with him in my back. Am I better now? Okay, I'm, I'm setting up. Yes, yeah. you're better now. Okay. Did I reread what I read or not? Uh, it, I, I have that also. If you want to read it, Ricky, go ahead, please. Although a nation under the direct protection of God did not need arms to defend itself, it is the Torah's way that people should conduct themselves in a natural manner, and then, if necessary, God will intervene with miracles. Okay. That's B-A-C-H-Y-A, Rabbi Bakya. I don't know who that is, but... Okay, I guess a, a lot of people forgot some of the discussion we had a couple of weeks ago, uh, because some of this was mentioned uh, two weeks ago. Uh, it, uh, yes, uh, Grace, would you, uh, Grace, uh, I'm looking for where your picture jumped to. You want to uh, enlighten us a little bit on that? Well, I think they knew they were going on a journey, right? Yeah. They would have to be prepared for anything. And knowing that God, I think Ricky just stated it from the reading she just yeah. made. But the whole gist of it, you know, um, they needed to be prepared for whatever may, you know, impede their path. And um, knowing that God was going to be with them, they also know that God will offer them trials. So they needed to be prepared for whatever may come their way, is what my heart is feeling. So, okay, that's all. Thank Sounds you. good. Sounds good. Any other comment? Okay. Uh, what I'm going to do is say it's okay to go back uh, in for what we had read. If somebody ever has a comment about something that they have more recently read and and uh, want to go back in one of the readings. I just don't want it to go too far ahead into the future because then that's going to add a lot of confusion. So uh, uh, so we let's let's try to stay focused on 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 the uh, on what we're reading in, in the Torah. So if uh, uh, someone would like to begin this uh, our reading today with uh, uh, chapter uh, th uh, 14, verse 5. I can do that. Okay, Ricky. Okay. When the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, Pharaoh and his courtiers had a change of heart about the people and said, What is this we have done, releasing Israel from our service? He ordered his chariot and took his men with him. He took 600 of his picked chariots and the rest of the chariots of Egypt with officers in all of them. The Lord stiffened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he gave chase to the Israelites. And the Israelites were departing defiantly. The Egyptians gave chase to them and all the chariots forces of Pharaoh, his horsemen and his warriors overtook them and camped by the sea near Pai Haredawa, before ba Baal Sephon. Pa okay, let's stop at that point. Uh, so any, any uh, discussion? Yes, Don. Uh, it's another case of uh, God hardening Pharaoh's heart. And oh, first they say, they, 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 first 
he says he will harden Pharaoh's heart here. If we go by the end of the last uh, readings that we did a couple of weeks ago, and now he's doing what he said. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And it's the same, it's the same thing. And uh, that has been answered already, Don. Well, it hasn't seen well, I'm not sure it has, Marty. Um, because okay, it, I'm going to let the rabbis repeat what they had to say. Okay. I wasn't there. <laughs> well, what have the rabbis said? Well, there's, there is some contention about this, at least in the midrashes that I've come across. And it's, um, it's getting, I, I'm, I'm putting aside what happened before the Israel, uh, the, the Hebrews escaped. Now they're on their way. And they could just keep on their way. But now, the punishment is, is um, doubling down because Pharaoh and you know, whatever Egyptians were left could be left to lick, lick, lick their wounds and try to put things back together. And then Moses and Aaron and their people could continue on across Canaan. But, but no, God is kind of coming back in again. To rub the Egyptian's nose in it and you know kill another old man. So I, I I heard what the commentary said earlier about that. Now it seems to me we're in a different chapter and possibly well, who can say what is necessary or unnecessary about God? I mean, I, I certainly wouldn't presume to do that. I'm just I'm just um, discouraged at the death. But isn't isn't that what commentary is about? It's left up to discussion, uh, to to to, uh, uh, understand and interpret the way you uh, see it. It, It's not. I don't think it's kind of set in stone that. uh, because if it is, what's the point of the discussion? If that's what you believe. So all of this information, I believe that uh, we're all talking about is actually left up for discussion. Uh, this, not necessarily to see who's right or wrong, but just for further discussion on it. Well, that's what we're doing here, Michael, but, but there has to be some, just as the Torah was finally fixed I'm sorry, what? Just as the Torah was finally fixed and has been copied in its form by hand since then, there has to be some has to be some accepted interpretation of what's in the Torah, it seems to me anyway. That it just can't be open perpetually to discussion and, and opinion. It has to be However, some- Don, Don, there are two types of interpretations of uh, religious liturgy. One is the word is fixed, and the other is the word changes from generation to generation. Take your pick. And that's that's why Midrash is there, because the majority feel it changes, and that's why the book lasts for a much longer period of time. Yes, Gail. I was just going to say, my way I would answer that, Don, would be to say, it's the living Torah. Yes. Okay. It's not dead. It's living, which means subject to change over the generations. And yeah. if, it, if it's a dead script, then what's the point of studying it? You know, it's, if it's not living, then why bother? Point. Oh, we have a, we yes, have a yes, Lynn. Sorry. Another okay. way of saying that is that revelation is continuing. That yeah. Sinai wasn't once and done. That God um, also renews creation every day and revelation continues. And so it is not fixed. You know, new, thing, new things yeah. are being revealed. 
as we read Torah through the lens of the 21st century right. and everything that's happening. So, yeah, yeah it's done. So let me ask Rabbi Mary, because I'm, I'm such a terrible amateur here. Um, Rabbi Mary, so it is, can we then say that whether God hardened Pharaoh's heart and forced him to follow after Moses and Aaron and the Hebrews is open to interpretation? I, I'm going to say something, Don, and I don't know if you were, I, I don't think you were in the time that I talked about it. And it's um, the issue of, as Marty was saying, how we read the Torah. What's your approach to Torah? You can say every word is true and I believe in it literally. Okay, so you can go there. But you can go to other levels, there are two more, and, and say, no, uh, these are metaphors, these are allusions, these are descriptions that you can say that it was written by the etzba of God, by the finger of God. And in that case, you know, your belief is stemmed from that point and you don't change anything and you don't interpret anything. <clears throat> but if you go to service, when we stand in front of the Torah, we says, Ki etz chaim. Torah is chaim. It's the chaim. It's for life. It's for living, as Lin was saying. You know, yeah. we live by the Torah. Now, you need to check yourself how you read the Torah. If you read it very literally, every single word is going to be as is. And if it says, uh, you know, if your children misbehave, you stone them. And, uh, you know, and, and, and being gay is, is uh, uh, what's the word? Evolution, you know, it's, it's something that you don't have. And then you have to start thinking, how do I read it? If you read word by word as is, it's a different way of reading it with interpretation. The other thing that I, my contention is that every translation is an interpretation because the translation selects right. what word to use and the, and the word the translation uses is connected with how the set of beliefs of the translator. I follow the Torah in Hebrew with the translation of stone, which is an orthodox way. Right. On my side, I have Friedman as well. And you can see that there are differences because every translation is an interpretation. And I think that um, I, it, this is one of the differences probably between us as a group of reformed Jews, reconstructionists, uh, renewal, uh, versus the ultra ultra orthodox that every word is as is not only that but they expand on it so you cannot have ice cream after uh, after meat so you know nowhere in the torah is but they wanted to make sure that the entire thing is covered we said siag la torah um i've been Talking, talking, talking. I don't know if I help you, Don. Um, but uh, check how you believe the Torah is. I, I'd like to add one thing. We had this discussion before, and I remember when we were discussing the the, the Hebrew word. Uh, the root word also meant honored, and to honor. Right. And if and uh, I know Suzanne, if she's with us now, and and she uh, she uh, uh, had a, a taken a liking to that because it it in other words, Pharaoh's heart was already set. He it, it, his personality, etc., and God is honoring that. It, it, yeah, the Another way of saying is, it would be God is affirming Pharaoh's idea. In, in this his, particular case, Morty, the word is strengthened. It's chazak rather than kaved. Okay. Yeah, they're both. Lynn, 
In the same sentence, you have both. Vayechazek and then Vayechabed, which is interesting that both words are used in the same pasuk. So, it, so you know, this this it depends on on inter, on how the discussion, how you want to make it. If you want to say that the uh, the God of the Israelites is warlike, and only concentrate on that, then uh, that's okay. That's that's how you feel. But uh, I don't look at it that way. There are times when all of us have to be warlike, and you <laughs> hope that the majority of the time you're going to be peaceful. <laughs> so what are we going to You know, we're in God's image. Why not have, let God have uh, the ability to sometimes be war warlike in defense, offense, just like we are all the time. And I, I have no, no problem with that. It, it doesn't mean everything. There's a lot, there's a lot more love in, in, the, in, in Torah than there is war. Yeah, yes, uh, uh, Larry. Do we ever get an insight into what Pharaoh thinks? We have seen more instances where God hardened his heart. What would it be if God did not try and influence his thinking? It's possible, sure. For, you know, you, you can say that too. I mean, you, you can argue it multiple ways. That's all I'm saying. Yes, Don. Uh, if I may, and I'll, I'll finish with this. Um, I do work very hard at trying to understand. I look at multiple translations. I look at midrashes all week. Um, this particular point is so pivotal in Jewish history, Passover, the Exodus, Moses. I mean, it's so fundamental that my, I find it hard when my sense of Jewish justice is offended by a God that I believe in. And so it's very personal to me to understand this. So I, I, I keep coming back because I want to feel loyalty. Uh, and, and this particular passage, passages, and these events make that difficult. For me. So appreciate everybody's help and in interpretation. And I will, there's, there, there, there are a few more chapters left in the Torah. I know, and this the same subject comes up in those chapters. Yes, so I, I can understand. Yes, yes, Gail. You know, perhaps Don, in some way, because you are bothered by this, it actually strengthens your sense of justice, which would be the lemonade. You know, so maybe that's it's a good thing. It's kind of a test. You're going, oh, no, that doesn't sound right. So I'm going to be a better person because I'm. You know, it stimulates your sense of justice. So maybe that's the good side of it. That makes sense? Sure. No? Yeah, sure. Thank you, Gail. Okay. And yes, Mary. And you know, Don, you're not the first person to be bothered yeah. by this issue of uh, drowning all the Egyptians. And I think I mentioned because when they cross the sea and all the Egyptians drown, uh, Miriam and the women start dancing and singing. And uh, the Midrash is, and God started crying. I said, what's that? Why are you crying? These are the enemies of Israel. And, and God said, yeah, but they are all my children. How can I rejoice when I see my children die? So you're not the first one to bother, be bothered by the issue of justice in this case, you know. I, I want to share something that it's not Torah Torah, but what you were talking about. Uh, this morning, I was thinking that um, someone posted on Facebook a painting of, um, of Mark Chagall in which you see a couple running away from a village that's on yes. fire. Yes. And someone wrote there, oh, this is so, so like what's happening now in Ukraine. Well, you know what? 
that picture is from the time of the pogroms of the Ukraine. Ukraine, that's right. On the Jews. So, so for me, yeah, I'm, I'm very sorry. I'm heartbroken of what's happening in, in Ukraine. But it's difficult for me to forget what the Ukrainians have done in the past. They really operated with the Nazis. They really pogrom us. They really did things. And I have to split my say, well, these are the children of God as well. And we don't want terrible things to happen. So you see, it's it's not black and white on what we see. And you, like the all good rabbis, being you one of them, uh, is questioning, is this justice or not? Uh, don't know what to tell you more than that. Good point. Good point. Well, let, let's go on. Okay. Uh, the, um, Mark Helene wants to say something. Oh, yes, please. I'm listening. And I'm just amazed at, at your insights. But without the generations passing on the Torah to the children for the next generation, your changes are very interesting in discussion. We have the Torah, as far as I'm concerned, Pass on to the next generation, so they too will have this Torah reading, and their children will have this Torah reading, and their great grandchildren will. Have. We need to give back to the children. That's all I want to say. Another good point. Very good. Thank you, Helene. Well. Did I hear somebody who wanted to say something? No, I was just asking how we ready to, for me to read. Um, I, so I, I just I wanted to, to go back. Uh, and the Egyptians are now giving chase to the, uh, the uh, Israelites. And uh, they, the warriors caught up with them uh, encamped by the sea. Okay, so uh, uh, Ricky or David, if yeah. somebody would like to read from verse 10. As Pharaoh drew near, the Israelites caught sight of the Egyptians advancing upon them. Greatly frightened, the Israelites called out to the Lord, and they said to Moses, what is it, uh, was it for want of graves in Egypt that you brought us to die in the wilderness? What have you done to us, taking us out of Egypt? Is this not the very thing we told you in Egypt, saying, let us be and we will serve the Egyptians, for it is better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness? But Moses said, yeah. uh, oh, somebody can, Ruthann, Ruth said. Oh, and, uh oh. Yeah, the Sid's talking. Something happened here, just to say. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, let us be, we will serve the Egyptians. Blah, blah, blah. But Moses said to the people, have no fear. Stand by and witness the deliverance which the Lord will work for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will battle for you. You hold your peace. Okay. Peace, peace, Comments. Peace. Bitch, 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 fetch, fetch, fetch. That's all the Jews did when they left. Everything to complain about. But I, that's kind of, you know, I mean, that's what I, you know, ah, you know, well, let us die. You didn't get yeah, us. Yes, Lynn. Uh, I, I have compassion on these slave people who were yes. disempowered and weakened and terribly frightened and confused. That's right. Um, they didn't want to stay. They didn't want to be in the wilderness. It's one of those places where that's the narrow, they're still in the narrow place. <laughs> yes, know? they are. They are. Uh, literally, 
Uh, it, if you if somebody takes some time to look at a map, they will see that they're still in this narrow place. Okay. Uh, the and also, what happens when you're in the wilderness? You can be eaten. You can be killed. Uh, Ricky, can, turn off. Turn off the microphone, your Ruth, microphone. It's sitting in the background at Ruth Ann's. I'm going to call Ruth Ann and tell her to mute. I can't mute her. She's the only one. Okay. No, so but I'm mute yourself. Mute. What? <laughs> mute yourself. No, no, no. It's not her. It's it's Ruth Ann's site. It's the, the interference is from Ruth Ann's uh, site. Anyway, yeah. uh, have the Israelites said this before? When did we ever read this? They just said, they just said, uh, uh, you know, when, when God talks uh, to the, uh, you know, through Moses and the elders and everything, they just say, yeah, we're going to do all this. They didn't. They didn't put up any any comments before, did they? I will go mute. I will mute. Okay, bye bye. Sorry, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. So, what is so? Uh, this is is this something that uh, that was uh, always in the background? that they were still in a doubting mood? You know what, Marty? I've been in, um, this was, I don't, I don't remember if it was the, the Czech Republic or Hungary or one of the places that was behind the, the wall. And uh, in, in our tour, we visited people in their homes. So uh, we went, uh, just a small group to the house of someone and they live in this horrendous building that the russians built you know mm -hmm. just pieces of concrete squares and disgusting no architecture whatsoever any case a big building and we come to their the, uh, apartment and one of the things i love to see when i travel is what's the difference between then and now and i ask them um so what can you say about life now that it's not communist and then and i'm expected oh now we have freedom of this freedom of that and they said well yeah we can travel now but you know at that time we had a job we had a house we had health care I was stunned, you know, for me, freedom is the most important thing. And, and, and the way of seeing things, it's, we have to put ourselves in the shoes of those people that the thought That's is right. not from our perspective, but there. So I don't know, I never thought about that this was the first kvetch, but who knows? Freedom, the, the notion of freedom, especially in the United States, it's such the freedom of speech is such a, you know, strong belief that it's difficult for us to see anyone that, what well, do you want it to stay a slave? I'm, it's interesting that you mentioned freedom of speech. Would they have dared to say this openly to the leaders of, of Egypt? Okay. Uh, it, 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 some people have said this was still a slave mentality as well. So, yeah. they, so yeah. they, they now are, they don't, the, the people really do not see the, the freedom. They're, they're saying these things, but they don't see it in their mind that, uh, that they are free. They're free now to speak their peace. And, and ask questions about things like Don. Okay. Got to keep asking questions. No, it, 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 it's human nature. It's human nature. And when it's stifled, 
for a very long time, you forget that you forget this. And so some people will want to go back where it, it's, it's defined, their existence was defined, but they were not free. But they felt safe, safer. The wilderness is an awful place. If you ever got, have, if anyone has ever gotten lost in the woods or elsewhere, it can be very frightening. Okay. Yes, Don. Yeah, I certainly understand how uh, fear would be a component in that case. They left everything. But we did learn, and also, but we did learn in a previous chapter that they left Hamushim armed. And mm -hmm. there's no mention of the, of the Hebrews trying to put those arms to use. But anyone who served in it, I mean, I remember in a military, the sound of live rounds cracking overhead that, that strikes fear in your heart. And you don't want yes. To. Um, so uh, um, I can understand how they were afraid. But still, there's no mention here that those arms were ever put to use and but finally god says well don't don't worry about it i'll take care of it well let's let's be realistic for a second uh when you join the military and you're now given a weapon okay and you're asked to use it okay it sounds fine i i'm in tra basic training and everything else i'm learning how to shoot and everything else until there's a human being on the other side trying to do the same thing to you. Re remember the scene in Band of Brothers? The movie, you know, the, and, and uh, the fellow has to shoot someone for the first time before they were just firing not... guns and he freezes. And, and Marty, one thing is that if Don, that you're given it a, a, a gun, and this is happening now, anything. and then you're in front of a tank. Yes. You know. This is this, this is what, what we see. That's what's happening. They came with chariots and horses and. That's right. I was in the military. I I, I know that. <laughs> so so and but when you're in the, when you're confronted with the real scene, you can be educated, prepared, gone through exercise after exercise, you never know how you're really going to act until you're in that situation. And uh, there are other th situations in dealing with medical emergencies in emergency rooms, how the doctors and nurses have to respond. A teacher that's suddenly confronted with a hostile student you can have all the training in the world, but you don't necessarily know in advance of how you will behave at that split second. Yes, uh, please, please, Ricky, you're muted. That was for me calling uh, Ruthann. Um, okay. I watch, unfortunately, with the news a lot, there was a young gal in Ukraine who joined the army and she was being interviewed and she was describing that moment when she realized if she didn't shoot the person into whose eyes she was looking, that person would shoot her or her brothers. And to watch the emotion on her face describing that was very moving because she turned, she was, I don't know, a school teacher or some, you know, normal working person who during this whole thing picked up, you know, the gun and joined the army. And it was just really moving how you could see the struggle that she went through in a flash that she knew she had to kill another human being or she would be killed. Yeah. Or her babies would be killed. And it was just very moving. And, and this is where PTSD arises. Yeah. So, uh, it, 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 because we're not, we're never really prepared for it. We're never pre really yeah. prepared. Yes, Larry. To follow up on Ricky's point, 
there are pivotal decisions we make and really it comes down to what is worth fighting and dying for protect your family for, um, to protect your country your god and these people are at that decision moment some say let's go back to what we know it's not good but we will endure stay alive um, others say enough it's time for a whole new concept it is not easy this is what uh, getting back to what mary was talking about look at what we've been shown with the people of ukraine and what they've been enduring but using larry's word what they have been uh, uh their leadership everything right down to the it you know it, it it's it's a heart it it in some ways they are showing certain ideals that we talk about, mm -hmm. okay? But I don't think they ever expected that they would be in this situation to do this now. And that and and that's what I what I was getting after. Yes, Ricky. Um, okay, it's slightly off topic, but it is on topic. When I read the Sunflower, which we've many of mm -hmm. us probably read. I felt I had to write. And the first thing I wrote is, I wish I would have. Or, you know, it was more, I don't know what I, I mean, my gut reaction is X, but my brain and heart reaction says, well, maybe I should. But it's like that pivotal nanosecond that, you know, that the Ukrainians have. I mean, in the sunflower, is, you had a little more time to think about it. But, um, that that turmoil that I was going through, I just felt I had to write. And I think I wrote about two pages about, you know, what I would do or what I wish I would do or what maybe I could do. But I have no idea what I would do because I've never been there. And that's the point that you're making, Marty, that until you're in that absolute and as this young yes. female soldier was, that absolute moment where you have to do something and, and not doing something is doing something, you know, not making a decision is a decision. Sure. So, yeah. yeah. That's all. Yes. Just, oh, uh, uh, Larry and then Lynn. Okay, to follow up on Ricky again, the sunflower is the national flower of Ukraine. Ukraine. Right. That's right. In, and and we need the yeah. sunflower oil. Um, but in the book, uh, The Sunflower, some people who died had sunflowers put on their grave. Other, it was gra mass unmarked graves. Yeah. And really the essence of the book is about um, forgiveness. Yes. And um, can we forgive what the um, Putin for um, crimes against humanity? And are there certain crimes that are unforgivable? unforgivable. Right. Yes, that is the point. Excellent. I like the grandmother who said, put a sunflower seed in every Russian's pocket so that, you know, after a while when his body decomposes, a sunflower will grow. I mean, I just thought right. that was just wonderful. There you go. Yeah, yes, Lynn. Oh, I was just going to add another perspective on, um, the idea of being confronted with a situation, um, a very challenging situation, um, uh, thre threatening your, if not physical survival, psychological survival. Mm -hmm. And that um, the pattern is, of course, a, like a coming of age, where like when you're a slave, you are kind of, um, I don't, I don't want to say infantilized, but like ch children, you're taken care of, and but you have to you have to toe the line. There's structure, but you know you do not have responsibility for your survival. And now you go out into the wilderness. It's like growing up, which we all have to do. And you have to make a decision. And daddy or mommy are not going to make it for you. And it's not a, a subtle. It's not a trivial situation either it's a maybe life or death situation 
So there's a tremendous psychological <laughs> energy around this position of being vulnerable and having to take responsibility for choices. And sometimes, and we hope we make wise choices, but sometimes we're just not there yet to have at our beck and call that deep wisdom. Very and well stated. Doing the best yes. we can. Excellent, excellent. I want, before I recognize Don, I, I was going to do this a little later, but since we're on this theme, it may be worthwhile to, to, to discuss this. Uh, and uh, some people have compared all of what we're encountering is uh, uh, the thought process that w would go on as a teenager, as Lynn very eloquently uh, uh, put, but th there's, <coughs> there's one other type of individual that is extremely vulnerable, okay? Put yourself, <coughs> excuse me, if you will, and try to put yourself in the mind of a newborn. There is a lot of similarity with what we're reading with the creation of the Jewish people and, and in the book of Genesis, Breshit. In the beginning. So let's go all the way back to uh, prenatal to natal existence. Do you want, uh, why would you, why are you so upset when you're born? Mm -hmm. You just left a very warm and, and nurturing environment. And now you're thrust out into the world and all of a sudden you're, uh, you're shocked. Mm -hmm. You're in a totally different environment. You, may, you don't know the words to express it or anything. The baby cries. Okay, so the baby cries. It's a good sign. But would some of those babies have really liked to go back? <laughs> How about people who suddenly experience freedom? The thought crosses, their, as we were discussing, the thought crosses some people's mind. Let's go back. Uh, but we have put in place a whole bunch of other factors today, not just uh, parentally, but medically and so forth. That kid's not going to go back. This is unidirectional now. And, uh, and so uh, the, uh, the kid has to learn. And it's not just through the teenagers, it's from day, you know, the very first day of existence. And, this, and so maybe this is also a way of relating these people have to learn a lot. Yes, uh, uh, Don, uh, Don gracious, well, graciously yeah. or otherwise, uh, <laughs> and then Ricky. <laughs> I, I, was, I was relating to the back first time i soloed in an airplane my knees were knocking and but i yeah. and i and i and i think um i'm thinking of childbirth i'm thinking more of the, the mother you know it's like exactly. Yoda said, yeah. there, there is no try there was only do you know, you, that's you right back, you can't back out you you can't, know? that's right it's in motion that's right good point yeah, yeah yes ricky all right I'm about to get very personal, but that's okay because it relates directly to what you were saying, Marty. Um, I've never really shared the, although maybe I've given hints of an abusive childhood that I had. Okay. Um, I've been in Al Anon and I've, my sponsor and I were sitting down with me and trying, getting me to meditate and try to find a safe place. 
And every time I found a, I felt safe, it was black. And she was saying, how about the beach? You know, you love the water. I said, it's black. And all of a sudden I burst out saying to her, the last time I was safe was in the womb. And that's exactly what you were saying, Marty. <laughs> I was safe in the womb. And then I came into this abusive, whatever, this, you know, discussion. So that, that turning point, I could definitely relate to what you were saying about that's the the ultimate not the penultimate the ultimate um switching um of realization or whatever you know it's it, it's a critical moment put it that way let's just leave it there now lynn brought up the other end of yeah. that spectrum yeah what? gail still had her hand oh, gail, i'm sorry gail i didn't mean to interrupt yes gail I was just, it just occurred to me that uh safety implies dependence okay but freedom is a whole different mm -hmm. thing and i was thinking about so many and, and this is not pejorative of the military but a lot of people that are in the military you know they have housing and food and job security and and i realize that there's some negative things too but when they get out a lot of veterans have problems adjusting to yeah. the lack of structure, if I could put it that way. Yes, it is. It is. And th this is part of what goes into what's being said. Now, they, too. They, they want to go back to jail. They want to commit another crime so they can go back to jail. So they'll have you know, that happens too. it's they're they taken care they're, of. They're, yes. And we're coming up with many reasons why people think this way. Uh, so this is not unusual, but now Moses is is going to say say something here. Uh, verse thirteen. Uh, have no fear. Have no fear. Stand by and witness the deliverance which the Lord will work for you today. For the Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. How does he know that? Some people have said this is his prophetic moment. He is now elevated, you know, he's also been you know he's making a statement has he seen something has god allowed him to see to see something about the future of the people that he can make this statement i think this is the another reflection on the personal relationship yes that god developed with moses and that uh, moses feels it somehow uh without being told that he, they, the Israelites will not have to worry about the Egyptians after this. But it goes back to that personal thing that Moses was fortunate enough to have with God. And we all do if we think about it, I think. We the opportunity is there. Let's put it that way, if, if we want it. <laughs> yes, Don. Oh, and Lynn, I, I'm sorry, I didn't know. I, Don is dead center on my screen, and uh, and Lynn, I'm sorry, I I don't know who had their hand up first. Go ahead, Lynn. Okay, go ahead, Lynn. You're on. Oh, okay. I was just going to thank say, you, Don. Thanks, Don. Um, that it's hinted in what um, God has spoken to Moses in, I guess, the beginning of chapter 14 where he says, um, I will stiffen Pharaoh's heart, he'll pursue them, then I will assert my authority and, against Pharaoh and all his hosts. So it's been hinted at that God will assert his authority and he will dominate Pharaoh and they Egyptians will all know that I am the Lord, meaning I am more powerful than Pharaoh. I will defeat Pharaoh. 
So that's that's an interpretation, but it's 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 not totally outrageous given the wording of the text. Okay, that, that's a good point. Those are good points, though, Lynn. Uh, okay, Don and then Larry. Yeah, it seems to me that this is just an expression of the necessary faith that Moses has, the same sort of faith that Abraham had when he took Isaac into the wilderness. That without that, there, there is no Judaism. Okay, good point. Good point. Yes, Larry. I'd like to read you Olta's commentary on 1413. Um, for as you see the Egyptians today, you shall not see them again for all time. The defeat will be so crushing that Egypt will never again attain this zenith of imperial power. This ringing statement is not the least of the exercises in um, gratifying historical fantasy in the story. Egypt, in fact, continued to be an intermittent military threat to Israel throughout the first Commonwealth period. So um, this is questioning that statement. Okay. Do you realize that the Egyptian people from that time, or the time of the pyramids or whatever, uh, is completely non-existing. What we talk about Egypt today is not the descendants of that people. Who are they That's descendants history. of? Well, people that walk around just like the Arab, you know, Saudi Arabia and Iraq and difficult to know. But uh, according to historians that those people, uh, uh, this, where are the Babylonians? Where are the Hittites? Where are the, um, we don't know, but the places that they lived are uh, habitated, but inhabited? Habitated. Uh, yeah. yeah, so, um, but historically, I, I, you know, when I was much younger, I saw that they are descendants, but it's not that. Uh, Check it out, Google. <laughs> okay. The next question I, I'm going to ask is verse 14. Mm -hmm. Moses goes on to say, the Lord will battle for you. You know, have no fear. You know, the Lord is going to, uh, will battle for you. And then there's a little phrase. You hold your peace. Yeah. Any comment? Well, Go ahead. Okay, Gail and Ruthann. I mean, well, Susan. I'm sorry. <laughs> when the people are complaining, they're complaining to Moses. They're not yes. talking to the God. They yes. talk to Moses. Okay. So he's trying to remind them that it's not me. You know, he's going to shift the responsibility to God. He said, and that'll keep you quiet. But the dialogue, they're, they're not talking to God. They're talking to Moses because he's right there, front and center. Okay. Why is there an exclamation point? In, in my book, there's an exclamation point with you hold your peace. We need Rabbi Miri. Tacha Rishon. Rishon. Yes. Tacha Rishon is um, uh, you are not going to speak. Although at the same time, uh, the Shoresh, the root is Heresh, which is um, hard of hearing, is, um, what do you call it? Um, it's uh, a person that cannot hear. And uh, so, but Tachrashun usually is just, you are not going to be, you're going to be quiet. Uh, mm -hmm. You're going to, in my mind, what it would mean is God is going to fight for you and you're going to be so surprised that you cannot say a word and, <laughs> or okay. that you cannot uh, ask for more. Uh, you're going to be so surprised. But um, I was trying to see the translation of Friedman on there. Um, okay. In the meantime, I look for, uh, for stone. I have stone in front of me. Um, 
Mary, I have a stone. Yeah, I, I have it too. I just looking for the translation of the of the word, how they put it. Yeah, you shall not ever see them that. again. Was not merely an assurance, but a commandment. It is forbidden for Jews to travel to or live in Egypt on a permanent basis. This prohibition is mentioned again when a Jewish king is forbidden to own an excessive number of horses, lest he be forced to send his people to Egypt. And it is codified. Excuse me, Ricky, could you speak into the oh. microphone? <laughs> okay. Uh, it's, not, uh, it's not merely an assurance, but a commandment. It is forbidden for Jews to travel to or live in Egypt on a permanent basis. This prohibition is mentioned again when a Jewish king is forbidden to own an excessive number of horses, lest he be forced to send his people to Egypt. And it's codified by Rambam. The question of why Jews, including Rambam himself, have settled in Egypt is discussed by Halakhic authorities who give several explanations. So, okay, it sounds like Jews aren't supposed to ever move to Egypt, according to... Okay, Stone. thank you. Yes, yeah, but... uh, first, uh, Suzanne, then Larry. Okay. I'm thank sorry. You, I, I... <laughs> <laughs> okay, two things. I, I had my hand up before for verse 13, and I just wanted to comment about the... Uh, about uh, seeing uh, the Egyptians again no more forever. And I can't help but wonder if that's a reference um, uh, to, to the afterlife in heaven, meaning that the Egyptians who were chasing uh, the Israelites, if they, well, I guess that means they don't make it to heaven. Um, and then in terms of verse 14, or says that uh, God's going to fight for the Israelites and for, for them to hold their peace. I, I think that's underscoring the idea that we're supposed to uh, turn our turn to God with and hand over our troubles to him uh, for him to help us and take care of us and and uh, and for us to, to trust in him. I mean, that, that's how okay. I look at it. All right, good. Good points. Yes, Larry. I have this time commentary from Hertz on 14, you shall hold your feet. This was no time for giving wild expression to fear, but to await God's deliverance in quiet confidence. And it's kind of similar to what Suzanne was saying. Yes. Good point. Good point. I'm much more cynical. And I would say that they were quetching and quetching. <laughs> and Moshe says, listen to me now, to Miri. Exactly. You'll see what God is going to do to them. And you shut up <laughs> and stop <laughs> complaining about why did you take us? So it's going to be such a... And by the way, Moses' temper, this is like a clue that, tells, that could be read as, you know, he has a temper. Remember, yeah. he, he's been rash before. A, a story about Moses where he was rash before, before he comes to Midian. What does he do when he sees this uh, Jew, th this Israelite being, uh, being, uh, uh, you know, uh, pummeled by a uh, an Egyptian guard? He kills him. Kills him. So he has that tendency inside, inside of him to be a little rash as well. So I don't know if the exclamation point is there because to, to give us a clue or not. We could interpret the words any which way, but the exclamation point is different. <laughs> it's setting up a pattern that will recur as he gets frustrated with the people throughout. Throughout the rest of, the, rest of right. the time in the wilderness. Right. So is it, you know, the, of the, the striking of the rock instead of speaking, you to got him, it. That's right. So, a, you know, it's like when a parent 
gets up to here with the, you know, disobedience of their, the, the children and finally has spoken nicely and said, don't do that. Um, stuck. Well, this is the way it's going to be. And they just keep pushing back until they trigger the parent. Okay. Very Quite good. Right. Yeah. That's a good, that's I a good way of looking at it. Not just yes, Gail. I have a question for Rabbi Mary. Mary, exclamation mark in Hebrew. We know this. <laughs> so how did how did this exclamation mark show up? Is this a decision that's fairly recent, or is this some you know? It shows up only in English. They are not no, point, right. They are not exclamation points but in the Hebrew know, in the Torah. Yeah, I mean, but that's wondering though in common terms. I mean, who made this decision to put an exclamation mark in there? Is this the something that's in the commentary like a hundred years ago? That's the translator. And uh, let me check Is just one, one, one. This is the JBS yeah. translation, the second one. Uh, the, the Friedman also has it. Uh, no, I saw pre. Stone doesn't have that, it. Really stone, the Orthodox oh, don't put an creation now. Okay, good they point. Say, the yeah. shall be yeah. battle for you, and you shall remain silent. Yeah. Okay. It's descriptive. So uh, uh, that's a good point. What uh, you see, uh, Don, this is a good example how an interpretation comes about. In the uh, in the in the Friedman and Hertz and I suppose others, they said God is going to fight for you and you will not speak. You'll be quiet. Now here at Stone, it says you are going to be quiet. Not exclamation mark. It's meaning you're going to see this and. You won't be able to speak. I mean, you know, an exclamation mark makes a difference on the interpretation. I, okay. I, I do. Okay, I, I see several hands. After Gail, uh, Larry, and then Don. Well, the only one of the few things that I remember from Hebrews class when I was in Ulpan was that the usual way for Hebrew to emphasize something is to repeat the word. Correct, Mary? So you would say kazakh, kazakh. That's one of the things. But yeah. there is also a tense, a tense called tzivui, that uh, in English we have past, present, and future. In Hebrew we have past, no present, no present. Past, present, future, and tzivui, which is command. And the commandments are written in that language, you shall not. You know, so that's another one. Oh. When we see the word twice, yes, it's emphasis, and the rabbis really uh, look at that very, very carefully, because because they are not uh, uh, exclamation marks, so you don't know what's the tone of speaking. So uh, assuming that by repeating the word, you mean you really mean it. Okay. Uh, wait, a minute, wait a minute, wait, 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 I, I, we're, we're losing track here. Uh, Gail, uh, let's you... Gail finish their thought. Let's, yes. let's Gail finish this Gail, thought. You, you Gail, you finish your thought and then I want to get on to uh, uh, other hands that were up. <laughs> okay. Example I always think of that repeating is when God is talking to Abraham on the mountain when he has... <laughs> He's yeah. Saying, yes. Abraham. Yeah. Yes. Good yes. point. Yes. Good point. Okay. With all of this, I forgot who was first. Is it Larry and then Don, or Don and Larry? Oh, Don gave up. Oh, I'm sure. Don's up, and then Larry this time. Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, I'm just. I just found it fascinating the idea of punctuation. I'm just imagining the 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 publisher of the translation saying, I'm giving you a hundred exclamation points, put them where you want. <laughs> well, I can see, I, we're going yeah. to come with, yeah. up with a possible yeah. answer momentarily, but it, it, go ahead, Larry. 
Okay, um, punctuation. I'm looking at Alta, which is copyright 2014. He's, and this is in quotes. The Lord shall do battle for you and you, you shall keep still, period, end of quote. So there's a period, not period. an explanation point. Okay. Now, let's spend a little time on just verse 15. If somebody would uh, be kind enough to read just verse 15. David? Okay. <clears throat> and the Lord said unto Moses, Wherefore criest thou unto me? Speak unto the children of Israel that they go forward. Oh, okay. that's the James, isn't that? That James translation? Thou and thee. Why do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> no, he, he's not using that. <laughs> but but the the why it's for without the the difficulties why would uh verse 15 read then the lord said to moses why do you cry out to me tell the israelites to go forward this is another unstated statement mm -hmm. what what had uh what was going on did moses say something that's been deleted? Did he think something that's been deleted? And Is this another said, part of uh, uh, someone else's story that's been, you know, that they're trying to t tie two tr uh, stories together? Actually, but, just to, to, to answer your question, my translation is according to the Masoretic text, and it is not the King James Version. Okay. So, so because, uh, you know, it, is it something Moses was thinking or as Moses had said that, that God thinks that there's a, you know, what, what, why did you just call me? You know, I, 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 I did, you know, I didn't expect you to do, you know, to invoke my name. Any any ideas? Well, yes, that, Ricky. Yeah, I'm going to go back to punctuation. Um, what if this were? Why do you cry out? Period. To me, you know, it's you can kind of separate that. Um, just by the punctuation. There. That's a very good one. Yeah, it's like, you know, what's that in the road ahead? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's what you said. <laughs> okay. Yes, Suzanne. Um, it seems uh, that Moses is not taking his own advice. In the previous verse, he's telling the Israelites to, you know, keep quiet, you know, hold their peace. And then in this verse, uh, God is... is uh, well, I don't want to say scolding, but <laughs> certainly is is uh, commenting on Moses crying out to him, and then reiterating to Moses to tell tell the Israelites to to you know go forward. So Moses wasn't taking his own advice. I don't know why, but well, because there is a sea in front of him. He cannot do it. He doesn't know what's going to happen now. That's he right. could not, what advice? The advice of moving forward doesn't exist now. They are in front of the sea. That's why I cannot say to the people, come on, come on, keep going. That's, that's the problem now. Um, but I think that, uh, Suzanne, you are right regarding the scolding. I think that God is scolding Moshe. And he's saying, don't speak on my behalf. I didn't tell you that I'm going to fight for them. It's a possible, it's a, it's a good possibility. Uh, it's an assumption. And at the same time, at the same time, 
uh, Adonai assumes, he says to Moshe, which is a very strange, these two uh, verses are very uh, strange. And it, it yeah. says to him, hey, look, I made you the leader. Can't you do any, uh, uh, any decisions on your own? And then immediately says, okay, okay, I understand. You cannot do that. Raise your uh, staff. But these two ones are tricky to understand. So whoever has an explanation, I'll take it. Good point. Good point. Uh, okay, Don has had his hand up and then Suzanne. Uh, Rabbi Mary, in the original Hebrew, uh, in that verse, um, is it clear that it's Moses crying out to God? Or is, if it, is it, I mean, is it, or is it God just referring to the people crying out? And the first part of the verse, he's speaking, God is speaking to Moses. But then the next part, it seems unclear as who's doing the crying, whether it's Moses or the people. Well, in 14, that, that's the problem with English, that the word you is in plural and it's in singular. So, God says, um, uh, Moshe says, God is going to fight you, plural. And you, plural, will be quiet. And now it says, and God spoke to Moshe, stop crying to me and, and speak to, this, to, to the children of Israel. Did I help? A, a little bit, but who's the subject of, of stop crying? Is it, is it the people or is it Moses? I, I well, how do you take it, Don? If you, you answer your own question. I, well, it, well I'm, at, I'm coming back to your question, Marty. Because yeah. It, well, it, right. It's up. Uh, who is... It's, but, you know, we don't know that Moses has been crying. We, I mean, that's a, that's a shock that he has been crying. The, but, well, it's not crying, it's crying out. Yeah, well. Crying out. Yeah, no, but Don has a very good point. Yes, because in 15, yes. it says, God says to Moshe, why you, you personally are crying to me? speak to the Israel, to, to Bnei Israel. You're right, you're right, because we don't think that Moshe was crying to, uh, but, uh, but it was the people that were crying that, you know, they want to go back. Uh, you're absolutely right. It's really difficult to hear, uh, why are you, Moshe, crying to me? I don't, I don't have an answer, uh, but it's, it's a very good question. Yeah. In Marty's question. <laughs> I, 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 okay, let, let, let Suzanne go, and then it, 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 we can read into this two ways. That's right. Go ahead. Go ahead, Suzanne. Uh, okay, this this to me is an example of, of how there's two different timetables. There's uh, our timetable as, as people and God's timetable. And when it looks like push comes to shove and our backs are up against it, um, that doesn't mean that that's God's timetable and we're just not going to change God's uh, schedule, as it were. <laughs> even, okay. though, even though we want him to hurry it up. <laughs> Good point. Good point. There's a yes, Gail. Could it be that God is trying to teach him how to be a leader, to depend on himself <clears throat> and show yeah. him, you know, look, okay, it's time for you to step up and, and do your job. And you don't need to consult me every other second, you know, and. Uh, well, <laughs> no, no, it's, 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 these are important points because if let's take the story in one direction. Moses doesn't invoke God in any way, doesn't mention God, and he just goes up to the water. He now has a choice. What is he to do? 
Well, God has shown me I can work miracles with the staff. I, I can get things done. What do I have to do? Do I touch the water with the staff? Do I hold it out over the water? Do I tell the people to go back? You, God hasn't said anything. So well, has something been lost? And, you know, to time, another part of the story that's been lost, that maybe the instructions were there, what to do. And God is now saying, come on, guy, I, I, you know what you have to do. You, this is what you have to do. Or do we take Moses' side and say, well, you never said anything. And we're between a rock and a hard place. No pun intended. <laughs> but it is, you know, all of a sudden, he, he's now confronted with a decision that he has never been told what to do at this point. No. So go ahead. Now he's learning to be a leader. He has to make a decision on his own. Oh, I mean, that's what's, yes. that's what's really going on here. Psychologically, okay. Moses is... Excellent point. But if Moses okay, well, I... did that yeah. with the people think it Moses was in charge instead of God. They still think he's in charge. Come on. Well, yes and no. If he did that, he's making an assumption that this is what he's supposed to do, but the people are going to look at him as working the miracle. Yes, uh, uh please. Marty. Let me read yes, to you what Rashi says, because it seems that that sentence in, in Pasuk 15 is, is problematic. So uh, uh, Rashi says, uh, he quotes, why do you cry to me? Moses too, he was praying. He was praying. He wasn't shouting. He was praying. And God told him, now, when Israel is in distress, it's not time for lengthy prayer. Alternatively, the verses render matitzak, why do you cry out, as if the plight of Israel is your responsibility, is your responsibility, a lie to me. Is it for me to save the nation? Therefore, you should instruct them to move ahead. That's what you were saying. And I will attend to their safety. So the role of Moshe is, um, as Suzanne said, you know, the, his role is to move the people forward. Leave me to take care of them. I'll be taking, your role is to lead the people forward. And, and though he's in front of the sea, maybe he should trust God, because if God is in charge of the safety, he's not going to drown them. Uh, but as you see, it's not an easy, it's not an easy verb uh, to understand. But you can take, you know, he didn't shout and he didn't cry with the people. He was praying. Okay. But that's... Good midrash. <laughs> yes, Lynn. <laughs> it reminds me of the, um, the Talmudic story about nothing, even though Moses pulled out his staff and they started walking to the water. They were just standing there. Nothing happened before they walked into the water, before Nachshon Ben Aminadav went into the water and, and he went in, and nothing still happened until he was up to his neck. Yeah. And then the waters parted. So that's reflecting um, Rabbi Miri's um, interpretation is that somebody had to move forward. Exactly. Good yeah. point. Yeah. Yeah. That's the point of we are a covenant. If you don't help to your, if you don't help yourself, I'm not going to help you. Okay. Good point, everyone. Any other comments about this? We didn't get very far, I know. But uh, any other comments about this? Well, uh, 
if you if somebody would would like to read yeah, I, verse 16 I, 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 okay but, but please please speak directly into the microphone i have something here from sporno oh know. okay um, yeah i read it yeah sporno offers a novel approach after the leaders castigated him from taking them out of egypt moses cried out because he feared that they were lacking in faith and would not obey him when he ordered them to advance into the sea. To this, God replied that he was misjudging the people. All he had to do was give the command. That's what Sparno said. Okay. Then you'd have to ask the question, how many of them would have obeyed? That is a test of faith. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's go on to verse six, at least try to get, uh, we have a little time. Yeah, we have enough time. So uh, now here are the directions. This is the recipe. Verse 16, Somebody, if somebody would read. Okay, and lift thou up thy rod, and stretch out thy hand over the sea, and divide it. And the children of Israel shall go into the midst of the sea on dry ground. <clears throat> and I behold, I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians, and they shall go in after them. And I will get me honor upon Pharaoh and upon all his host, upon his chariots and upon his horsemen. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord, when I have gotten me honor upon Pharaoh, upon his chariots and upon his horsemen. Okay. Let now. Any comments about this? Okay. Well, yeah. Now, yes. All of, sudden, he's, all of a sudden, he's, he's um, hardening the hearts of all the Egyptians, not just the Pharaoh. You know, I noticed here. Because I don't think I've heard, uh, it's, uh, and I will stiffen the hearts of the Egyptians so that they won't ask questions, they'll just go in well, after them. But the thing is, up until here, it's always been all stiff and, you know, stiff in Pharaoh's heart. Now right. it's all the Egyptians is the point I'm making. Right. Yes, Suzanne. I was wondering what, um, what the Hebrew word for honor is. Is there another it's interpretation? Kavod. Kavod. And it's also heavy. Kaved is heavy and kavod is honor. Now here, um, Ricky, uh, Ricky was talking about it. There is a little difference between what he used to say about Pharaoh, about Pharaoh that he, he, he makes his heart heavy. In this case, it sounds more that he makes Pharaoh and his soldiers heavy because they have all this equipment and chariot and everything that they have so they cannot move fast and that's why they get stuck in the mud of the sea uh, but if you'll find the way uh, the time in which um, God said uh, and I'll make his heart heavy it looks differently than this one. Okay. 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 Thank you. I, I still go with, um, I, I, I don't go along like uh, Marty said with uh, heart in the hearts. I, I go along with uh, honor what's in the heart. So, I mean, that, that, that's just me. <laughs> well, I'm not trying to reword everything, but I, I'm just saying that that that's what was told to me by by a rabbi at, at one point. So, anyway, uh, any other comments about this? Now, one of the things that that stand out here. Uh, is that in verse 16, uh, 
Okay, he, God, you're going, Moses, lift up your rod and hold out your arm over the sea and split it so that the Israelites may march into the sea on dry ground. Mm -hmm. It's 16. Okay, and uh, what I found interesting was the phrase on dry ground. Now, when the Egyptians are going to come come along and do this, this is going to be repeated, uh, but we might as well discuss it. Uh, when waters are pushed aside, is the ground left behind dry? Muddy. Yes. And the Russian tanks dealt with that, and we had a muddy season in Maine. You know, just... Okay. It must be in the desert where the just like so, the, it just runs off. So if in. this, it, it's not only the parting of the water is going to be the miracle. It's that the Israelites are also going to be able to walk on dry ground. Mm-hmm. Yes, Don. Now, Marky, I need to answer Suzanne. Suzanne. Oh, okay. Uh, All right, Don. The translation of Friedman, (laughs) this is before we go. The translation of Friedman is close to your interpretation. Not exactly, but you'll see. He says in that sentence, it translates and it says, um, I'll end. So, I hear I am strengthening Egypt heart. We heard that before. And they will come after them, after the Israelites. And I'll be glorified. I'll, I, God, will be glorified against Pharaoh and against all his army, against the chariot and against his horsemen. So, because it's in, in Hebrew, it's in a very strange way, Habda. So what he talks is glorifying God, not, not that uh, he's respecting the enemy, or, but he is going to respect me for what he's going to see. Anyway, Marky, I apologize. I just uh, okay, uh, that's okay. was looking for the, that. Um, I appreciate it, too. Yeah, I, I, like, I like that. And, and that was Friedman, you said? Yes. yes. Okay, Don. I'm coming back to Rabbi Mary again. Um, for Good. The tra- translation of dry ground compared. But every every Jewish kid knows and Moses says, don't get your shoes muddy. But, um, but what is the Hebrew in this case comparing dry ground with other other kinds of ground? Uh, it's... Um... Yabasha is is used as earth, you know, like you are in a boat on the sea and you said, oh, I can see Yabasha, I can see land, land. Um, so that's what it's, Yabasha, that's, that's versus sea and land. But the, the root of the words is dry. So it's difficult to say that uh, and they went into the sea on the ground. It's not that it was dry, but there was no sea there. Uh, you understand what I'm saying? That, that yeah. the opening of the sea was complete, that you could walk on land. Okay. It's not you. that you had shallow water. Okay. Any other discussion? Anyone want to read on? I was going to say, they must have had a humidity of 5%, like in you know, Green Valley. <laughs> what? Okay. The, so... had, uh, oh, Suzanne asked me, they must have had a humidity of 5%, like in Green Valley. Oh, right? oh. <laughs> Well, they were in the desert. Come they on. were in the desert, yeah. 
Hey, Ricky, it's your turn. My turn? Oh, okay. Does, uh, you want to read uh, verse 19? Sure. <clears throat> the angel of God, who had been going ahead of the Israelite army, now moved and followed behind them. And the pillar of the cloud shifted from in front of them and took a place behind them. We're going to push them over a cross if they don't want to go follow. I mean, that's... Go ahead, go ahead. Read, read oh, verse 20 you. also. And it came between the army of the Egyptians and the army of Israel. Thus there was the cloud with the darkness. <clears throat> and it cast a spell upon the night so that the one could not come near the other all through the night. When did it okay. become night? When did it become night? I guess they, have, they hung out too long. So the, uh, the angel of God. Okay, we know that God is going to appear in a pillar of, uh, of uh, fire or, or a cloud. Okay. Right? We've, we've read that before. Uh, uh, that God is going, it tells them this, and it, it, the Israelites are following by day and night. Uh, and now, uh, what does it mean by the angel of God? Here again, we go in the translation of what Malach means. Malach means messenger. Right. So the cloud is a messenger of God and the fire is a messenger of God. God sent them for some kind of job. And in, in this case, the job of the cloud is a little different. Okay. So, what? Uh, any, uh, any other comments? Yeah, earlier the fire was at night and the cloud was during the day. Yes. And here we got both of them. And and you, the cloud was always in front. Everything oh, yeah. was always in front to lead them yeah. in a direction. That was my first comment. Was originally the, they were in front to lead. Now they're behind to push, but they're also in, in behind to camouflage between the two armies, so to speak. But I just found it interesting that they're both there at the same time. Right. Good. Point. So, yeah. Is, you know, and, uh, yes, Don, go ahead. If I may, I'd like to insert some archaeology here to verify this event. There's a uh, some Babylonian tablets called the Venus tablets of Amiza Duda, <clears throat> which record. Babylonians were amazing astronomers, very accurate. And these tablets record the rising and setting of Venus on the horizon. And at this time, about 1500 BC, there's some erratic changes to the rising and setting of Venus to the extent it's so erratic that the tablets have been discounted as being evidence of anything. But because they correspond to the Exodus at this point, the parting of the Red Sea. Um, I, my, my hunch is that there was some disturbance to either the rotation of the earth or the tilt, the axis, that corresponded with the parting of the waters. When you read these tablets, it, they, to me, they seem inerrant. You know, you can't really, it, it, they don't fit with the regularity we expect but they do correspond exactly with the movement of the pillar of fire and the pillar of smoke from one place to another. It, they would have recognized a star being different from a pillar of fire or, yeah. or a cloud. Or no, they weren't saying the pillar of fire and the smoke right. were the same as the They're beach. talking about splitting the sea. But there was a disturbance in the position of the heavens. Okay. One of the things that has also come up has been, uh, oh, 
th this obviously is a description of an active volcano. Okay. But wait a minute. They wouldn't have been stupid enough to walk into a volcano, get close to one. That's one. Uh, even with, and, and there's, they would have known about a, a specific location of smoke and fire, but it would be very hard for that smoke and fire coming from a volcano in one location to go in front of them. And then behind them. And then behind them. So that is something that uh, I just want to point out that, yes, I know there are different I, concepts that, and we keep trying to make sense out of things, but I don't think we, we can make sense out of the moving of this pillar, okay, of fire or, you know, going back and forth. So if, it's, if the fire and smoke was in the sky, it wouldn't be anchored to the earth, so. Yeah. Okay, uh, Don, Don, uh, do you remember the story of Peter Pan? Mm -hmm. sure. Do you? Sure. Well, but do you remember that Peter Pan couldn't fly? Sure. Okay, sure. You didn't need any scientific explanation for Peter Pan flying. <laughs> he plays. This is the story. But I don't see. I'm not. What I'm trying to say is that we, with our Western used minds, need scientific explanations for everything. This is how we think. It needs to make. Uh, it needs to make sense. That's why some people don't vaccinate because they don't believe in science. But you need to have, we need to have a scientific base to understand and believe. I'm going back to, uh, to the Torah. The Torah is our story, Glory. not our history. It's our story, it's our mythology. It's our narrative of our people. So now again, if you want to take everything verbally, uh, literally, you know, the, the sea split and they walk around. It's a nice story, you must say, it's, it's lovely. The, most of the jokes in the, about the Torah are about the crossing of the sea. Uh, but, but it has been tried again and again to understand what happened now. So what you're saying, it could be very well be, and you can hold it as a truth. I don't have any problem with that. Uh, the thing is that we, we humans have been trying to say, well, the sea went back and the sea moves and it wasn't the sea, it was a, a, a river. Or, or you can also go to Friedman's book, The Gale, pushes so much and quite reasonably. That's called Exodus, the Exodus. And he has a very interesting historical, archeological uh, explanation. Uh, and it depends, you know, not just the interpretation. What Friedman uh, 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 emphasizes in his first book, who wrote the Torah, you'll see that depending on who wrote the Torah, the story goes. You know, for example, if the Levites wrote the story, they're going to give a lot to the Levites in the Torah. They're going to give them this and this and that. Because they wrote, you know, the, how do we say the winners write the, the, the story of what happened. So Don, I never, I do, I'm completely ignoramus about what you were talking about, the tablet that was found. No idea about it. Uh, well, but you can hold it at something that explains what's happening. Well, Rabbi Murray, I, I have a 
graduate degree in writing fiction and I've published stories, so I understand stories. Um, but I'm also, <laughs> a I'm also a scientist and um, I, I can't accept the Torah as being 100% metaphorical. I do feel that it has grounding in actual history. And so there, therefore, as both a storyteller and a scientist, I do pursue the connections between archaeology and the Torah, because I think it's important. And thank, you know, I appreciate what you're saying, but I, I yeah. can't go strictly on metaphor. It doesn't work for me. Yeah. So, no, I but, understand. But you know what they said, that all the archaeological findings did not find any, any, anything in the desert, the Sinai desert, about all these millions of people or hundred millions or whatever in, in that area. There's nothing. That's what I read. And this is, you know, if it was something that the sand might have covered it so, so much that they'll never find it. But uh, go back into that. Uh, again, Google. <laughs> Uh, what archaeology says about uh, Exodus? Because okay. it's a very interesting point. At the moment that they'll find something, we're going to review what we're doing. Yes, Gail. No, I was just going to say, I don't think that Friedman's interpretation of Exodus takes away anything from the Torah. I found it a very logical, interesting uh, theory, if you will, but one I'm very comfortable with. I don't think it took away anything from the story. I really don't. Neither do I. I believe in the story 100%. In the story. Like, I believe in the story of Peter Pan, that he flew, and then the kids flew, and then whatever <laughs> happened. Because you get into that as I believe in it. I, I, I don't with all my heart, I, not just I believe, I believe that it's probably the most wonderful creation of humans in, in the world is the Torah. Okay. Any other comments? Yes, Suzanne. Um, I... Uh... Well, I guess I, I'm trying to say several things at once here. Uh, I do believe that there is archaeological evidence. I, I think that a lot of it still is, is suppressed. And I'd like to point to the Codwells who uh, have documented uh, the real Mount Sinai and the split rock, you know, where uh, Moses hit with a, uh, his, his rod and the water came forth and and uh, they, they did a lot of work at great personal risk to, to them uh, to get this information uh, to the world, so to speak. And I also think that there's a lot in, in, the, in the Torah and, and the rest of scripture that uh, is based on the supernatural which our mm -hmm. Western scientific minds don't readily uh, take to. Um, uh, but it, it's, it's there uh, in, in, in black and white for us, us to read. Um, now, there, uh, regarding the angel of God, I, I guess there could be several interpretations. One, uh, of which, well, there's two uh, that I'm familiar with, and uh, one has to do with with being a Christian. There are there are, are Christians who think the angel of God in this case is Yeshua, um, but there are other people um, who think the angel of God could be the Holy Spirit. I I, I don't know. Um, I don't think it's the Archangel Michael because he is definitely named in other parts of scripture. So whoever the angel of God is, is, is an angel that's unnamed. 
And uh, yeah, I guess that's, that's about all I wanted to say. It, I don't know if we'll ever come up with a final answer. Uh, Rabbi Plout says, uh, perhaps uh, there were two sources here uh, or not. We don't know. We don't know. And this, this can be debated forever. Okay, this can be, we can, we can uh, talk about the angel and the cloud, the, the pillar of fire and all that. And we cannot come up with an adequate explanation for it. We'd like to, as, as was pointed out, that, we, uh, that the Western world has linear thinking, uh, cause, direct cause and effect. Uh, it, it works very well. Uh, anyone who believes in science is going to think that way. Yes, I, th I think that way. But I have also learned that there are other ways of looking at things. And when, it, it, when we're dealing with the realm of, of uh, spiritual, uh, of, the, of the spiritual, uh, th then anything, uh, if anything, it's conceptual, not, it is the other side of the brain. It is not linear. Okay, so spir spiritual, and I think that's why you have then many other interpretations of, of the different spiritual aspects of things. It is, remember, this was also written at a time when uh, people saw things, didn't, may not have known how to describe them like we do today, and Don points very well to that. Uh, but at the same time, what is the real focus of this? As has been pointed out, I think Gail pointed this out, it's, it's the meaning behind the story, not the detail like we're going into. I was going to wait until we get across, when it, all the people crossed, you know, get a, finally get across and go through all of these experiences. And then we're going to go back. We were going to go back and cover a lot of what we're discussing. However, however, I, I want to put the thought out and I just want to, uh, to, um, to rem remind everyone that in, it, when we finally get to the other side of the sea, I'm going to ask the question, why is this important to remember? You have to take the entire story. The author isn't going to, uh, of any story or poem or whatever, is not going to focus on one word or one phrase like we're doing. Camus would love this, okay? <laughs> but it leads nowhere, okay? <clears throat> all that it does is say that we have to think in, and, and look at all different perspectives along the way, but then it's our obligation to now look at the entire story and what are the meanings that we have learned, that we have gleaned from it. And that's going to be a homework assignment for in another week or two, if we get to that point, when we get across the Red, the Reed Sea. Why? Why is this so important to remember? We've addressed some of it before, but why are we, this encompasses a lot. Rabbi Mary passed the, term, passed the remark that this is a very critical point in Judaism. Everything that follows th this event is very critical in Judaism. So why we're asked to remember it. We started to address that. Why? Don't get wrapped up in the minutia. Uh, just one word that is, has to do with translation. The meaning of the word Torah not Torah, Torah is American, Torah is teaching. Mm -hmm. Just don't forget that. I think it's crucial. It's not 
uh, it's, it's didactic, it's teaching. I'm not going to compare it with anything else. Okay. That was a better way of saying what I spent so much time on. Any, <laughs> no, anyway. you did wonderful. You say it's so wonderful. Well, no, well, well, no. It, it, we can get too wrapped up in the details, uh, and it, it, you know, it, 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 it can uh, destroy the the reason why it's here. Analysis paralysis. Okay. Very good. Very good. Yes, Gail. Just because I know what time is up. I was going to say, don't hang tightly, tightly, and grip tightly to a belief. Right. Relax. Look at it. That's right. Stand back. Dwell on it. But don't let, I'm not going to use the word hysterical, but <clears throat> this the harder you hang on to a belief like that, you can get into real difficulties, and you're going to lose the real meaning sometimes. That's right. That's right. And that, that's why I want to spend time, uh, you know, Passover is just about ready to end. And I'm sorry we couldn't get to the final part of the story, but it's, it's a very crucial thing to understand. The, the rabbi, it would, uh, when he was leading the service, was sort of getting us in that mood. There's much, much more to this than just the little details. And I don't, I don't want to mislead people into thinking that just because I have a tendency to like to go into the details, that's the analysis. I think looking at the entire thing is also very, very important because the message is not in any of the details we've been discussing. Okay. And I want to point that out, that it, it's a trap. And that's why I've always said when we go back, we did this in Bray Sheet also, periodically we have to go back and go and, and look at other meaning. That, that's all I'm going to, I'm sorry I took so much time on that. But and any, thank you, everyone. It was a great discussion. <laughs>